it is my great uh, pleasure, of course, to introduce uh, Todd uh, Woodward today for his talk. And as Malar mentioned, this is his birthday. So it's, uh, thank you, Todd, for accepting to do this talk on this uh, special day. So Todd uh, Woodward is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry at U UBC. He's also a research uh, scientist at the uh, BC Mental Health and Substance Use uh, Services uh, Research Institute. And he's the uh, director of the UBC Cognitive Neuroscience of Schizophrenia Laboratory. So Todd, I've known Todd, Todd for uh, many years uh, already. And I have to say that uh, all, he's been a pioneer in different fields, especially with the brain, looking at functional brain imaging uh, data using a network analysis and multivariate uh, approach. He's been doing this for like very early on, way before many, many people got interested into a multivariate approach to functional MRI uh, data. So in terms of his work, and as you will see uh, today, so he's been really developing this approach of task-based uh, brain uh, network, which is very, very uh, interesting, uh, as you will see. He's been, uh, he has made a really significant contribution in the brain imaging side, uh, and really combining cognitive tasks with symptoms of psychosis, schizophrenia, whether it's delusions, auditory hallucination. So this has been a uh, great uh, contribution. And in, in addition to all his brain imaging work, he's been quite involved also with the development of novel uh, inter, like a non pharmacological uh, intervention for delusion. So one approach that is called metacognitive uh, training that looks at the cognitive biases or thinking uh, trap, uh, if you will. He has made there uh, quite a significant uh, contribution uh, too. Uh, also, very pr prolific researcher with over 160 papers uh, published al already. And he has trained some excellent students, including Katie uh, Levin uh, in, in our uh, group. He's been also uh, a great uh, collaborator for many of us. Uh, and we have seen several grant application or grants uh, together. He's been also a great, uh, has been great too, to work with uh, Todd. So today, the, the title of this talk is uh, Task-Based Functional Brain Networks Detectable Using FMRI. So more than just a pretty picture. So Todd, it's all yours. Thank you, Martin. A great introduction. Um, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. So whoever the host is needs to, oh, here we go, okay. So thank you very much again for having me here. And um, <clears throat> this is always a bit unusual doing the Zoom talks, but hopefully we can have uh, an opportunity to be interactive since um, maybe it's a little bit easier to interact on Zoom, we'll see. But <clears throat> I will be talking quite a bit about uh, methodology today, about fMRI and um, the methods that we've developed, if my computer advances that is. So, uh, since, you know, probably it's been, you know, uh, getting 15 to 20 years that I've been trying to uh, address these issues, um, what are the anatomical characteristics of, of task state functional brain networks? So, many of you may know the study of brain networks through resting state research, which has sort of dominated the field for the last well, 10 or 12 years, and now it's sort of coming back around to task state um, research. Task state research, uh, traditionally, the results have been um, univariate type of approach. So it's a bit new to think about networks involved in tasks, but this is not new to me. We've been working on this a long time. But the reason the title of the talk is more than just a pretty picture is because we're used to looking at pictures of brain networks, pictures of activity, but um, there's not as much emphasis put on the cognitive function of those networks. And cognitive function can be sort of speculated as it is in resting state research from the pattern of the anatomy. But um, in order to determine what the cognitive functions of a network are, it's uh, helpful to drive that network with a task and to compare activity between different task conditions. And in that way, you can um, go past just looking at the picture and really understand what the function of that network is. And then there's questions about um, whether or not fMRI can distinguish between the cognitive functions involved in different tasks and whether or not those um, 
cognitive functions reflect with different networks. So um, just uh, sort of getting to the punchline, we've found that there's actually a really consistent set of networks that are involved in all tasks. And um, those networks can kind of be fit to different task additions to work more towards understanding the function of those networks. And then finally, since we have a set of networks that we can study that um, are consistent between tasks, it's easier to, to um, determine how they're affected in brain disorders and whether the effects are um, network or task specific or symptom specific. So that's kind of the, the whole approach. It's very difficult to talk about all of the networks in detail in this amount of time. So I will just mostly talk about the methods, give a few examples, and I think that's all I'll have time for today. Um, so this is Yoshio Takani. He's a retired professor from McGill, and many, many of you may know him. But um, he wrote a paper, uh, Michael Hunter uh, was my, and you can see that mouse, right? Yeah. It was my um, PhD supervisor at University of Victoria. And Yoshio used to come to Victoria in the summers <clears throat> and work with Mike on multivariate statistics. And they'd invite me over for beer and sushi. And uh, through talking with them and reading Yoshio's work, I developed I could see that constrained principal component analysis, which was developed by Yoshio among a, a whole array of other brilliant multivariate statistical techniques. But I could see that this would be a good way to analyze fMRI data. So probably about 15, 20 years ago, I started working towards analyzing fMRI data with CPCA. So CPCA combines regression and multi uh, regression analysis and principal component analysis into a unified framework. And the application I'll be talking about today is actually the most basic application, which is fairly easy to understand. In fact, all of CPCA is not that difficult to understand, but it's, it's a really comprehensive method. And I'll just be talking about the simplest case today. And the basic idea is you can go from one data set uh, that has a certain amount of variance, and you can portion that variance into different um, orthogonal sources of variance that are um, separable using information about subjects if they're on the rows and, and variables if they're on the columns. It's a little bit complex to explain right now. But once that total source of variance is separated into the orthogonal sources, and there can be up to nine, you can do a principal component analysis on each source of variance and find out different components that are completely orthogonal in those different sections. Anyway, these are the 20 papers so far that we have published uh, using this method, and I've highlighted the top four. Two of them are authored by Katie, who's um, on the, on the, in, in the Zoom call today, Katie Levine. Um, and two, one of them is Nicole Sanford. These are the most recent papers, and these are the ones I'd recommend uh, if you wanted to see the sort of where the technique is developed to. Nicole Sanford just finished her PhD in my lab as well. And they're all excellent pieces of work. I'll be mentioning them, some of them today. So these are the uh, networks that we've been able to find. So sort of like through years and years of looking at these networks, and, and those of you that do functional brain imaging know that you're always seeing this kind of, you know, uh, medial type of activity, which we sometimes call the anterior cingulate. Uh, then there's always visual cortex, parietal. It's sort of like you're seeing the same areas over and over. But over years and years, I finally realized that there are certain configurations of these networks, these task-based networks that are consistent. And at first I would, I would map them all to the resting state networks and that seemed useful at the time, but I realized that none of them, except for the default mode network A here, actually map on um, precisely to the resting state networks, at least the ones put forward by you and other um, researchers. So we ended up um, having to come up with names for these networks and some of them are, probably familiar to most people. For example, the default mode network is familiar. Um, the response network is probably familiar. So there's a left lateral, in this case, they're press, pressing with the right. If people are pressing with the right hand, then there'd be a left lateralized sensory motor activity here, right lateralized cerebellum. Um, auditory perception is probably quite familiar. So it's a uh, so, um, superior temporal type of activity here. Linguistic processing, there's um, Broca's and Wernicke's area on the left side here. Those are all probably quite familiar. Um, these ones might be, they look like resting state networks, but in details they end up not being. But more importantly is what do these networks do and under what conditions? So um, 
let me just first talk a little bit about what we're doing with fMRI. And I know that we kind of all know this, but I just wanted to go over it. Well, maybe we don't all know it, first of all, but even for those of us that are familiar with fMRI, it's worth thinking about some of the limitations that those data give us. So um, what we're actually measuring is the blood oxygen level dependent signal, which is similar. It's based really on blood flow and moving oxygen to areas where neural activity is required. So in this case, I'm actually um, carrying out a study on hallucinations at the moment, fMRI and hallucinations. So if we were to be studying hallucinations, and this would be time, so this is um, 30 seconds here. So let's say that a person hears a voice four times in 30 seconds. So this is just a depiction of a hallucination here. So they would hear a hallucination, and I, I just have this um, to between zero and 2.5 seconds here. There was a voice here, there's a second voice, a third voice, and a fourth voice. So if, 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 you know, if we're block plotting here, say there was um, one um, voxel that, or one part of the brain that responded perfectly to a voice, so that when you hear a voice, the blood oxygen level dependent signal actually sort of starts, de it's delayed relative to the actual event. So the, if the event is here for two seconds, the hemodynamic response starts to increase and would peak here and then start to go back to baseline. So if you hear a second voice before this gets to baseline, it actually pushes the whole thing back up. And in this case, it's just peaks and just at the point it peaks another voice is heard. So that pushes it back up even higher. Then it makes it down to this far. Then a fourth voice happens that goes back up again and then no more voices goes right back to baseline. So this is actually four events. And this is these one of these or this shape of each voice is what we're trying to detect. But what we end up with is this is rather complex type of shape, which is basically all of those hemodynamic responses added together. And so what normally is done with um, a univariate type of analysis, traditionally, you would use you know, software to compute what the hemodynamic response shape would look like for when four events happen in this sequence. And then you would use that model uh, as you know, a compare so as sort of like prototype for what the response should look like, which is here, and you assume that shape, and then you have the actual bold signal that you measure in every single brain area that you have. So you might have maybe fifty or sixty thousand different brain areas. All of them have their own bold signal measured, and basically you're just correlating the assumed shape with the actual shape. And in this case, I used a beta, but a beta weight and a correlation are the same thing when there's only one independent variable and one dependent variable, which is a univariate analysis will be, well, in this case, it's one independent variable. There may be more, but it is one dependent variable, but it's just that there's 60,000 of them. So every single voxel that you have, you put on there a color that corresponds to the degree to which your actual bold signal matches your assumed shape. So this will be, you know, bright yellow or white, which is, you know, a T value for this beta that's quite high, which means that the actual bold signal in this area match quite well to this assumed shape. And then down here, it might, you know, be a T of 4 or 3.5 or something like that. Then all the other areas that don't have a color, we just don't put anything there. We just leave it. So that's the traditional univariate type of analysis method. So <clears throat> the problem with... Um, you know, studying hallucinations and, and many other things is that um, people actually, because we don't know when people are hearing a voice, they have to press a button when the, at the beginning and the end of the voice, that's one way to do it. So when they start hearing the voice, they press the button. I, I guess I should move that button press a little bit after the voice because they wouldn't be able to tell it before. But anyway, at the beginning of the end, they'll press a button. So now really what you have is the hemodynamic response for the voice and the hemodynamic response for the button at exactly the same time. And I haven't um, precisely uh, mapped out what difference there would be between a situation where you actually just hear the voice and when you press the button, but it really wouldn't be that much difference. So basically in this two seconds of time, there's some button pressing in a voice. And so you're basically ending up with two different networks, one that is involved in the voice hearing, another one that's involved in the button pressing, and they both basically have the same shape here. So if you're going to use a univariate type of analysis and assume this shape and match that to all places in the brain, it's going to be almost impossible to be able to tell whether it's the button press or the voice. 
And so what you'd end up in this, in this case, so th if this is a button press type of um, network and this is um, a voice hearing network, so superior temporal and then um, a response type of network, you would get activity or you would get, you know, a high beta or a high correlation between the SU model and the actual bold signal in all of these areas. But really what you have is two different networks. And so <clears throat> that's why we want to use principal component analysis. So the first, these, these are the principles that we use um, when, you know, CPCA is applied. And these principles are kind of, you know, that we've stuck with from the beginning that allow us to do this type of, uh, the, you'll see how the results are different than what you'd normally get. But the first principle is we don't want to do 60,000 univariate analyses. We want to do a multidimensional type of analysis because in this case, basically what you get when you're matching to one assumed signal is just a flat image with all the voxels that match when some, when actually there's different dimensions in there that won't be detectable unless you do a multivariate method. So that's why we have this first principle, multidimensional analysis method, which is this, just principal component analysis. You could use independent component analysis or any other type of um, an, a multivariate method. And um, CPCA is not defined as much by PCA as by the constrained part. So C being constrained principal component analysis. PCA is a pretty, just a very easy type of multivariate analysis to do with a few lines of MATLAB code, which is why we've stuck with it from the beginning. Um, but there's three other principles here. Um, first one, besides the multidimensional analysis method, and this is the, that's the PCA part, but the C part, the constrained part, is isolation of task related variants prior to network ex extraction. So what often is done, including with resting state, is you just take the fMRI signal from the whole brain. So and like I said before, there's maybe 50,000 voxels. And then this would be each person's two second or three second brain scan. And so person one might sort of be this first section, person two is underneath and you can just to stack each person's um, three or 400 different volumes or TRs or full brain scans in sort of a uh, long shaped rectangle here. So stack one, two, three, so there might be 10 people here say. So there's 10 people's worth of um, time on the rows and then there might be, you know, everyone gets aligned to the same space. So you might have 50,000 variables and maybe about 3,000 rows. So this is 100% of the bold signal. And you could do PCA on this, but once you do that, you end up with a lot of components and you have to relate them back to the task timing to try to determine which are related to the task. And a lot will be, but in sort of um, usually confusing ways. And that is because this source of variance is not optimized to task timing. So using multivariate multiple regression, which is the constrained part of PCA, you can split the total um, variance in the bold signal into about 10%, 8, 10, 15, 5%, depends on the task that is related to the task timing. And then there's going to be residual variance that's not related to task timing. So it may not be surprising to you that most of the variance in the bold signal is not predictable from the task timing. So in other words, for if you're studying hallucinations, um, we saw that there were four different instances of hallucinations during that 30 seconds. And so you can use that timing information to try to predict some of the bold activity. And usually you can pull off about 10 to 15% of the variance. So that means that most of the things the brain is doing aren't actually, you know, locked to task timing. So if you're just thinking about what should I be doing later or what should I be doing now or anything that isn't exactly related, that's most of what the brain is doing. So separate out this 10% or 15% or 12 or whatever it is it's actually very powerful because now when you do the principal component analysis, every single network will be related to the task that you're interested in. You don't have to try to figure out which are related to tasks. You're guaranteed that all of them are, unless they happen to pick up movement, which once in a while happens, because movement can be perfectly correlated with a task on with certain types of tasks. So that's only the first two principles. Let me just check my time. And um <clears throat> The third principle, so those are the, those two principles, CPCA, constraining is the second step, and PCA is the first step. These other methods don't have to do with CPCA, but they have to do with choices you make as a, as a functional brain imaging investigator. 
um, many multivariate methods and, and maybe just because some of them are quite complex and you know traditionally um, computation has been too difficult to analyze 50,000 brain areas simultaneously with a multivariate method. So, so it's possible to choose only a few regions of interest. So then in advance you hypothesize these regions I want to look at and then if you're lucky you choose some that are involved in the network that's involved in your task but you know, I think that's essentially impossible to include all areas that are involved in your task. So we always made sure that we used every single voxel that we had available instead of choosing out a certain, certain regions of interest. And finally, um, we didn't want to assume any hemodynamic response shapes because it turns out that like the title of the talk is not just a pretty picture and it's the um, exploration of the bold signal, the hemodynamic response shape that is um, responding to the task that is so powerful and helps to, helps you interpret the function of those networks. It's not necessary at all to assume a hemodynamic response shape. You can use a finite impulse response model that actually ha has the data tell you the shape. So I'll, I'll talk about all these things in a little bit more detail here. So like I was mentioning before, the multidimensional analysis method is the PCA part. And that will help you separate out a network that's involved in auditory perception from one that's involved in um, responding. And that is possible because they will have slightly different um, responses. I'll go over that in just a second. And again, isolation of task-related variants. That is this step, taking out this 10 or 15 percent and separating it out from the 90 percent that's not related to the task. So the multidimensional analysis on the constrained part of the variance. Inclusion of all brain areas has to do with making sure you have all voxels in the columns here and not just selected regions of interest. And the most difficult part to understand is actually um, how the FUR model works. Uh, it's very, very straightforward once you understand it, but for some reason it seems like it's a little bit of a mental shift. So I'll go over that in a little bit of detail now. So what is actually in this model. So I have yellow here. This model, which is going to be a final impulse response model, will take out the variance that's related to the task. So again, here is how the um, hemodynamic response generally will look when you hear voices and press a button to indicate that you're hearing that voice. And what we want to find is this shape, one of them which will be averaged over all the trials. So um, this is the way it's set up. So I'll just take a second to try to explain this. If you don't understand, you can always um, you know, ask more questions. And if you still don't understand or want to, you can um, you know, contact me afterwards or Katie, who's a world expert on using this finding impulse response model in a multivariate um, approach. <clears throat> so what we do here, so this is a full brain scan. So the first one, this would take two seconds. This would take two seconds, another two seconds, another two seconds. Typically, it can be it can be three seconds or 2.5 or even shorter than two. But um, this um, this is basically the rows in the data set. So I was telling you before that um, each row is one of these brain scans. So this is basically if we can just focus on this these two columns here. You uh, take a full brain scan here for two seconds, a full brain scan here, and then on the third full brain scan you might present these four letters all at once. Then there's another scan where nothing happens. And then on the fifth scan, you would present that letter and the person has to say whether or not that letter was um, presented previously. So that would be like a working memory Sternberg type of task. <clears throat> and so what we wanna know is which brain networks are involved in this whole process. And that's going to take, as we, as we um, talked about before, we present this at, um, okay, this would be two, four, six seconds. And then this goes to eight seconds, this goes to 10 seconds, but the hemodynamic response will actually increase over 10, 12, all the way to 20 seconds to get back to baseline. So we have to estimate all of the bold signal changes that are induced by this, which will take quite a bit of time. It will be going to five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 scans. But we just want to estimate the activity when the increase on the very first scan an increase in the second scan and third scan and fourth scan after starting to present these stimuli. So that's why we're putting zeros and ones in here. And that may not be that clear, but this is subject one, the condition of four letters and the first scan after stimulus presentation, subject one, four letters, second scan, 
subject one, four letter, third scan. So we're actually estimating the increase in the third, fourth, fifth scan after starting to present these letters. So I will go over this in, in, in from a different angle if that's not clear right away. But basically each one of these columns just detects increase in bold signal after stimulus presentation for the next 20 seconds. And so here is uh, the type of hemodynamic response that you would actually measure from four voices. So before I showed you the idealized shape, but this is actually what you would really measure with bold signal, okay? And so this is say one voxel, we measure bold signal for 30 seconds. Underneath there was four voices. How are we going to find the shape that is underlying each voice by looking at this? Well, using the finite impulse response model, and it, it may not be that clear, but this is the estimating the first scan after, after every voice. This is estimating the second scan after every voice. This is estimating the third scan after every voice. And this is estimating the fourth scan after, or sorry, this is the 10th one. So you have one, two, three, four, you have 10 of these different columns of zeros and ones. This is just a graphical depiction of zeros and ones. So this is just a one, zero, 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 one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, like I showed you on the last slide. And this is literally <clears throat> just the beta weights that would come from a regression carried out in um, like a univariate regression carried on Excel or SPSS or whatever you want, where there's 10 independent variables, all these zeros and ones, and one dependent variable, which is the bold signal. And so what you end up do asking is, this is how much increases is on scan one, scan two, scan three, up to scan 10. So we have actually literally done this, and this is the betas plotted on this graph. And so we, at uh, when on the very first time point, there's really not much increase in bold signal. So this is negative 15, this goes to negative nine, 17. So actually all of these betas are plotted. And um, from this, this dependent variable, using these independent variables, plotting the betas, you actually can retrieve the hemodynamic response shape that it's very close and this is again just using Excel and SPSS and putting in zeros and ones and uh, with this I just created the bold signal that would be perfect predicted from SPM or other software and just added some noise and then use that as the dependent variable these are the independent variables plot the shape and you get the perfect hemodynamic response shape so the bottom line is that the fur model which is just zeros and ones can actually pull out the hemodynamic response shape um, that underlies that type of crazy looking um, shape. So this is the same set of independent variables and this is maybe a slightly different shape that is involved in a different network. So from using the FUR model, uh, you can pull out two different networks. So this, this network that was involved in you know, auditory perception and this network that was involved in responding might have slightly different shapes and you can pull that out using a multivariate method and the finite impulse response model and going by all those principles that I already mentioned. <clears throat> so the multi the multidimensional analysis method allows us to pull out these different networks, isolating the task related variants first, make sure that every network is related to the task, inclusion of all brain areas, make sure that we can detect uh, the full network instead of just a subset. And this um, FUR model makes, means that we don't assume, we don't just put on the brain uh, image matches to an assumed shape, we actually have the, uh, we actually have the bold signal pulled out for us. So now we can say, oh, the response network has this type of shape, but the, um, but the uh, you know, auditory perception, which may be involved in hearing voices has a slightly different shape. So that's the whole methodology. So if you're, you know, it didn't follow that. Now I have the more fun part with the brain pictures, but that's just a full explanation of, you know, the basic idea. And that's not even any math at all. <clears throat> so Katie, you can see that since my last attempt to give this type of talk, I actually did not show any equations and tried to explain the whole thing without it. So this is um, Nicole Sanford. It's my PhD student. Well, not anymore. She finished uh, last uh, December. And I would just want to explain this paper that's part of her dissertation. Her whole dissertation is available online. It's a brilliant piece of work. Um, and this uh, paper published in Cortex is also um, you know, part of the dissertation, which I'll explain just as an example of how we can um, you know, retrieve different networks for a simple task and how the networks, you know, this is basically a depiction of 
these four um, networks that were retrievable from a working memory task. So that's the anatomical depiction. And if you're experienced, you'll be able to see certain networks and you probably are familiar with some of them, like this is a default mode network. Probably familiar with that response network, uh, the sensory motor type of regions. And then you can see there's some sort of, you know, um, executive type of thing. And you might say, oh, it's the ventral attention network or it's the um, frontal parietal network or different type of things that seem to fit which is kind of the hand wavy thing that you can do with anatomy. So we wanna go past the anatomy and have a more precise description of what each network does. And so this is um, a Sternberg type of task that was uh, published in this Cortex paper. So we have four uh, letters presented or six letters presented. We have hashtags here. So this is a four letter condition or you can present six letters. So um, um, I don't have that displayed here, but obviously it's just, you know, a, a load manipulation where there's either four or six letters. And then there's a period of time when you have to remember those four or six letters. And then um, there's a letter displayed and you just say whether or not that letter was seen previously. So a typical type of Sternberg working memory task. And the manipulations we had here was had four or six letters and we had a delay condition or there was sometimes no delay condition at all. So that people would see these letters and there would be no break at all. And then they see this and they just say yes or no right away. So with those two manipulations, a load manipulation and a delay manipulation, we can find a lot of interesting information about what these brain networks are doing. So what we've done is we've taken the bold signal, constrained it to the variance predictable from task timing, done a principal component analysis on it. And I can't explain in detail how, but um, that, First of all, the constraint was done with the finite impulse response model, like I just explained. The multidimensional analysis was done. And then you can retrieve these using the finite impulse response model. Basically, you can retrieve these shapes. There's a little extra step in there that I won't have time to explain today. But in this, for this um, task, these four different networks um, emerged. The response network, uh, the default mode network, and two other networks that I'm calling here initiation and internal attention. And so, um, how do we use these hemodynamic response shapes to help us understand or to confirm that we know that's what these networks are doing? Um, so uh, I think I, I can talk about, I will talk about that down here a little bit. Um, so, so well, first thing you can see is that this, there's the networks peak at different times. So that's just a basic, you know, observation without looking in too much detail. So this is two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve 10, 12 scans. So this one peaks at about eight to 10 seconds. That's earlier than any other one. This is 10 to, 10 to 12 to 14 seconds. This one's 12, 14 seconds. This one condition peaks at 12 and the other one peaks at 16 seconds. So already we can see um, this is first, these two are second, and this is third, which makes sense from sort of like what we know about working memory. We have encoding first, we have maintaining second, and we have response third. And so that's, that's sort of the easy part. But then what about all these differences between blue and, uh, and red and these uh, differences between dashed and solid lines? So uh, the difference between blue and red is the difference between four and six letters. <clears throat> and the difference between solid and dashed lines is when there's no delay and when there is a delay. And every, you have, you know, one thing that took a long time to learn is that none of the, uh, well, once you have enough subjects, None of the differences between the lines, and we, and we test for significance of different shapes and different responses to conditions using um, repeated measures ANOVA. And you can see that the standard errors are quite small on these responses. They're very, very consistent between subjects. And so we have to trust the differences between these lines and try to interpret them. Like, for example, this kind of looks like a collection of four lines uh, that are kind of the same. But when you do uh, an ANOVA on this, you'll find out that the difference between four and six letters, for example, is significant. And the difference between delay and no delay, so the difference between blue and red is also, uh, sorry, uh, blue and red is four and six letters, but uh, solid and dashed is uh, no delay and delay. So the solid lines here are when there's no delay, and the dashed lines are when there is a delay. So you can see that when there is a delay, the hemodynamic response falls off more quickly than when there's no delay, which is the complete opposite 
of this one, for example, when there is a delay, so the dotted lines, there's a longer increase. And when there's no delay, this drops off quickly. So already, you know, we uh, can distinguish between these anatomically and we can distinguish between them that way. So we have to figure out why that is. <clears throat> and I will tell you why, unless someone wants to jump in and make a guess about why that is. This is easier. So this, uh, <clears throat> look at the difference between uh, blue and red. So that's the difference between four and six. The load manipulation uh, ends up having, well, <laughs> there's a lot of things to explain. First of all, there's no increase in this right at the beginning. So whatever this network is involved in actually doesn't start until after these letters are taken off the screen. That's, you know, maintenance, right? Maintaining the information. And when there's a longer delay, when there's four seconds compared to zero, the difference between four and six letters is very, very big. And uh, the and then there is just a bigger increase when there's a delay when there's not. So that all fits with with being involved in internal attention. Initiation. Why does the activity drop off when there's a delay compared to when there's no delay? When there's no delay, the actual uh, display is longer. There's no there's no four seconds in between. So there's just these four, then immediately a letter right here. So it's basically a five second display. So this is, extends out a bit longer for a longer display and this drops off quickly. So this is involved in just when the stimuli are presented, there's slightly more activity when there's six versus four letters. And so we can, this is why the talk is called more than a pretty picture because we dig into these hemodynamic responses and really try to um, figure out um, what the function of the network is. And so when we, and what Nicole did in this cortex paper is actually merge two tasks. So I'll talk about that in just a second. And I will, I know I've been talking very quickly. Does anyone want to say anything? Okay. Um, so when we uh, did this analysis uh, with just the, right off the bat, we sort of have this type of pattern. So what this shows is actually ends up being a merging of two different networks. This is the response network, and this is the uh, maintaining or internal attention network. And because, so the response, the response network has to have four seconds between uh, when the people, the four second um, delay. That is because this is when there's no delay, and this is when there is a four second delay. Whether or not there's a delay, you have to respond. And so in this case, you're responding uh, when there is a four second delay, you're responding four seconds after when there's no delay, obviously. So if there's a response network, there has to be four seconds between. In this case, there, but, and when the true response network actually has no load manipulation. So there's not more activity for six versus four letters. But in this case, there was more activity for six versus four letters. And that's because this ended up merging together the internal attention network and the response network. And so when we talked before about, you know, a study where you're um, trying to distinguish between hearing a voice and pressing a button, the hearing the voice and pressing the button signals kind of merged together. And that's what happened in this most basic analysis. Um, because this is when there's uh, no delay, the response of this peaks around 10 to 12 seconds. And the, and the peak of this is about 10 to 12 seconds too. So the internal attention network and the response network got merged together. And then this is when there is a delay. And again, there is a delay here. The peaks are, are different, but they're, they're, uh, they're close enough so they actually got merged together in a basic analysis. So what Nicole did was merge together that working memory task with another task. Uh, this is what we call a thought generation task. And in this task, you either hear a sound file play that says this is something you need dinner on. Uh, <clears throat> and this is actually Katie's published a couple of papers using this uh, using this task as well. Or, or you hear a sound file play. So you're either thinking silently to yourself what you do with that object or you're hearing a sound file play. The reason we uh, wanted to merge together these two tasks is because this task involves thinking silently to yourself. And working memory also involves thinking silently to yourself. This working memory task involves a response, yes or no, but the thought generation task actually has no response at all. So either you're just hearing a sound file play or thinking silently to yourself, but you're never pressing a button. 
So when we do it that way, um, we find interesting comparisons between the different responses. So um, what we, sorry, I'll just back up here. So uh, before we had this type of network, so you can see, uh, well, for example, here's the insula. This is the anterior insula and the posterior insula are kind of together on this network. But once we get the response network, the insula actually, it turns out, is a little bit more posterior. So what was mixed together before separates out into this response network and this internal attention network. So this is how we, in real, this is an example of solving this problem of two events happening close together. But when you use a multivariate method, you can separate them out. In this case, we actually had to merge two different experiments to separate them out. And the reason why that worked is because the response network has the two different peaks. So this is when there's no delay and this is when there is a delay, but there's actually no response in the other hearing and generating tasks. So there's a deactivation of this network. But when you're um, carrying out internal attention, uh, that's involved in both tasks. So there's an increase. So this is generating. So that's the thinking to yourself and hearing, hearing the sound file play. They both activate and these activate too. So because there's such a different response uh, a different type of activity in the response network in the two tasks, but a similar type of uh, activity for internal attention, we were able to separate those two out, which um, that's getting back to the voices and the button pressing. If they have slightly different responses, you should be able to separate those two out. So now we have to kind of double check that everything works. So there is no, um, there is no load uh, effect for a response. So there's not higher increases for when there's six letters relative to four, so that's good. <clears throat> and there is not, if we want to hypothesize that this is a response network, there cannot be activity in the other task for this network because there's no button press. So we hypothesize there'd just be a flat line. But in fact, we found out that the response network is actually deactivated. So when you know you don't have a response, according to this, you actually deactivate this response network. So everything to do with this hemodynamic response shape fits in with the theory about that being the response network. We kind of knew that already from the anatomy, but if you were to look at that and that, those two different networks, you would never know that that is actually a combination of a response network and an attention network. But when you, set, when you look at the hemodynamic response shapes, you can tell very, very easily there shouldn't be a uh, load uh, effect in the response network. And this is the more pure response network, which is more posterior. And this is internal attention network. So we're hypo So again, this was a combination of these two networks. So you can see that if you look at the insula here on this slice, it's a little bit more forward internal attention, back on response. And those two were combined together up here. Um, so we can anatomically, we can see this is an attention type of network, but really the power of it has to do with looking at the hemodynamic response shape again. So you've already seen this, um, that we're looking between four and six letters. That's the difference between blue and red. When there's a four second delay, when you have to maintain the information, there's a much greater effect of load. And uh, the difference between the solid and dotted lines is the difference between no delay and the delay. So the dotted lines is when there's a delay. And that just extends much later and much more active when there is a delay. So this internal attention network, thinking silently to yourself, it matches with the working memory experiment, but doesn't match with the other merged task when you're hearing uh, a sound file play, should there be more activity when you're hearing a sound file play or when you're thinking silently to yourself? And the whole reason we merged these experiments was because we thought that there would be higher activity on the network involved in maintaining the letters, you know, in your internal attention. And so the other task that has thinking silently to yourself versus hearing has to be higher for thinking silently to yourself. And if it's not, the hypothesis is not supported. And here is hearing the sound file play, and here is thinking silently to yourself. See, there's much more activity on this network when you're thinking silently to yourself relative to hearing sound file play. So the whole thing fits perfectly in combination with the fact that none of this starts until the letters, like the letters are displayed for four seconds. Four seconds is to hear. 
So the letters are displayed here, and nothing really starts until a bit later, until the letters are really displayed, and then the, there's an increase. So we actually published, you know, I think three or four working memory papers and schizophrenia and using this task, but we could never find this network involved in paying attention to internal representations until we actually merged with this other experiment. Anyway, that's all there in the Cortex paper. There are the results, and that's why we have purple and green lines, because each one of them is hearing and generating. And uh, uh, th this is one experiment, purple, green, the other one's red and blue. Anyway, if you have a chance to read the paper, I think you'll find it uh, rewarding. So now I'm almost out of time. So I'll just quickly go through, this is just basically talking about how the internal net attention network here, the one I just talked about, how it differs from the other networks. And we now have, um, this is Chantel Percival, my uh, research assistant, and that's Hafsa Zahid. Together they've developed a method using MATLAB where we can actually get a new network and classify it into the nine networks that we've identified. Um, so in this case, there's 85% on one, one network to be classified. There's 80%, 85% positive loadings, 15% negative. And we come up with a Z value that tells us the degree to which the to be classified network matches one of our templates. And this is a very good match. A Z score of, uh, of two around like that is probably a correlation of 0.8. It's, I won't I have time to explain exactly how that's done. So there are the networks. I'll just quickly uh, show a couple of uh, results to do with um, psychosis. So this is um, the, the, the uh, auditory perception network, and Katie Levine has published a couple of papers showing that there's hyperactivity in this particular network in hallucinating patients. So the green line is um, hallucinating patients. Um, and this is the hearing the sound file or thinking silently to yourself. And so this is the dotted line is hearing. And this is people with schizophrenia. And no hallucinations is people with schizophrenia hallucinations and there's hyperactivity in this network. But only when they're hearing the sound file play and not at all when they're thinking silently to themselves. So that may not be what you expected, but that is what the results show. Um, this is Katie's work. Sorry, Katie, I don't have your picture up there. I don't know what happened to it, but... Um, this is Katie Leving's PhD dissertation. There's two published papers uh, uh, based on this type of work. So this is another network we call the Cognitive Evaluation Network. And um, if any of you have followed our work in uh, delusions and cognition, uh, integrating evidence that disconfirms a belief uh, is impaired in people with delusions. And we now know that this particular network is underlying the ability to integrate disconfirming evidence. And there's reduced activity in this network with people with delusions uh, and schizophrenia relative to controls and also um, people with schizotypy, schizotypal type of um, ratings on the SPQ scale. So there's Katie's two papers there. And this is a little bit more uh, advanced. Um, this is actually, Katie, this would be new for you, but this is, <clears throat> Turns out that if you don't want to, and I'm sort of, you know, I think the field is getting a little bit more past just using groups. So in this case, making a hallucinating versus non-hallucinating group, making a delusional versus non-delusional group. Um, and in this case, Katie actually correlated the activity in the, in the, this network with, uh, you know, the ratings on the SPQ scale. So I'm, you know, wanting to do more of that type of correlating um, activity in the networks with different symptoms or different, you know, performance in the scanner, performance outside the scanner, which is what, what uh, Katie was quite focused on. And uh, what turns out that, and this is just the last piece of information, I know I'm running out of time, but it turns out that here's a, this, this task is Paul Metzak, who's also a PhD student, now a postdoc in Calgary. This task involved, uh, responding, is this an odd number or not? Is this uppercase or lowercase? Is this an even number or not? And mixing in color with number with case, and you can have trivalent or univalent or bivalent stimuli, and it's more difficult to respond when there's trivalent stimuli relative to bivalent or univalent. So this turned out to have three different networks. What you can do is, it turns out that the whatever cognitive process is driving the hemodynamic response to the peak is not the same one that's allowing it to turn to baseline. So this, we don't know, it's not, I don't know yet whether or not it's possible to identify exactly what drives the hemodynamic response to the peak relative to what allows it to come back to baseline. But sometimes like in this network, it's driven way below baseline um, before the, you know, immediately after the peak. And in other uh, 
networks, it kind of just slowly goes back to baseline. <clears throat> so what you can do is separate increase to peak values and return to baseline values. And when you do that, you, you know, as I've mentioned, there's a hemodynamic response shape for every single subject. So you can have an increase to peak for every subject and a return to baseline for every subject, for every network, for every condition. And this actually is just a principal component analysis of those uh, up and down. So in other words, up to the peak or down back to baseline. And the principal component analysis gives us up on one component and down on the other component. So they are separable. They're not the same source of variance uh, over individuals. So this is up and down for, for one network. This is up and down for a different network. And this is up and down for a third network. So now you can correlate these component scores with reaction time in the scanner and symptoms and things like that. So in this case, this attention network correlated with accuracy and reaction time. So more activity, more accuracy, faster reaction time in patients. But this one correlated with symptoms, not with reaction time. And this is a language type of network. And that network shows uh, less activity when people have poverty of speech. This network actually showed more activity when people have poverty of speech. And, and none of the networks were correlated with symptoms besides that one. So that's kind of it. Um, there's a, uh, that's the whole series of steps that we would take in any type of uh, uh, fMRI CPCA. So hopefully we'll have some time for some discussion and there's a list of all the people that contributed to this. All right, great. Uh, thank you, Todd, for a very interesting talk and, and really also for, uh, I think, really building a strong, uh, a strong case for, for multivariate uh, approach. So we have a first question I see in the uh, discussion. So uh, allow me to read it to you, Todd. So uh, basically the, the question is about uh, ta like task-based uh, PLS analysis. And just perhaps if you could elaborate, because several people have been using PLS uh, uh, here. So to, could you perhaps elaborate uh, a bit about the differences between the CPCA mm -hmm. and PLS and what, what are the differences between these two uh, approaches? Yeah, and whether yeah, you have any advice as to when CPCA should be used as opposed to PLS. Well, I think PLS for sure is based is is based like you can you can put a basically the ideas are very very similar. Like when you look at this when you look at this, and I'm not an expert on PLS, so you know if anyone there is, we might have more of a discussion. But all of these, I believe, are also met with PLS. Um, but the way the the math the um, matrices that are input into PLS are very different than the ones that are uh, input into CPCA. And so PLS is basically the rows of the data in PLS are actually subjects for one thing. So that means that you could more easily you could have you know a, on the very first step you could correlate, uh, for example, reaction time with the networks. Because reaction time is on the level of individuals, but CPCA is based on the level of scans here, and you can't correlate with individuals till you get to the last step of the increase to peak and all that. So if you're, so it may be that PLS would be would be, you know, it's a more immediate first step going right to those correlation of individual differences. Um, so, but you know, PLS kind of misses this step of modeling the. Um, what they what it ends up doing is kind of averaging over trials to isolate the task related variants. Um, but in this case, you can get just you just get a richer hemodynamic response shape um, relative to PLS. So I won't say too much more of it because I know that um, a lot of people are um, using PLS. And um, the bottom line is, well, actually, <clears throat> we've reanalyzed the um, you may know Donna Addis at the Rotman. So I met with her the other day and we reanalyzed some data that she has published already in neuropsychology using PLS. And well, basically the results ended up looking, the networks were tighter, the human health response shape were more informative. Uh, and it just seems to give a picture that's clear, a, a, a picture that is clear of the responses that are underlying the task. So I didn't have time to show that today, but we're in the process of writing that up and anybody who's interested um, can contact me or her. Okay, great, thank you. Um, well, I'm waiting for other questions, but I, I have a few on my own uh, that 
taxonomic to us. So you, you've mentioned also using uh, often for these analysis now trying to, to perform correlation with, uh, with, with symptoms. And uh, so two uh, re related questions. So the first one is uh, often symptoms like uh, our, the distribution uh, our ratings are skewed. Often you have a lot of people without the symptoms or and then some with mild and a few uh, with the severe. So how do you handle that, having this skewed or at least non-normal distribution of the symptoms of severity? Um, well, if it's, uh, well, for example, we uh, use basically, usually use parvy speech um, for, for negative symptoms, uh, reduced spontaneous movement, uh, reduced button affect, and those are usually pretty good. But for uh, we have thought disorder and then we have inappropriate affect for disorganization. But inappropriate affect is always, there's not very many people that really show inappropriate affect in a sample. And so I don't usually try to, you know, uh, change the distribution. I'll usually kind of just leave that one out. Mm -hmm. And all of the other, you know, delusions, hallucinations, distribution is usually fairly good. You know, when we use the SSPI, which has five levels. But if there were, you know, some discrepancies, for me personally, I'd probably try just trans transforming everything to ranks. Mm -hmm. As long as it's the, but then, you know, if you transform to ranks and then you do a Spearman's correlation, that is, uh, that is, um, uh, that is a rank, that the Spearman's rank mm -hmm. correlation is that. So mm -hmm. that usually takes care of, you know, most of the problems. But, you know, correlations, Pearson's correlations are quite robust to, you know, deviations from that assumption. So for me, I usually leave out the ones with a really uh, unequal distribution. I might transform to ranks, but that's usually the extent of, of what I'll do with that. Great. I think we have a question from uh, Malar. Yeah, thanks, Todd. That's a, a great talk. Um, and, you know, I think it's really interesting to see you tease out the different pieces of the hemodynamic response function, which is something I don't see a lot of, especially in, in, in the task-based fMRI work that I've seen. Um, mm -hmm. One thing I wanted to ask you about was a little more about the constraints on the constrained PCA. Can, mm -hmm. you, can you provide maybe a bit of a, a summary of what those are? Maybe I missed it in the talk, but what those are and, and kind of how those impact um, the way the data gets analyzed? Well, CPC in general is uh, has a, has ways to constrain the rows and the columns, and and in this case, okay, I'll, I'll uh, put it in a more uh, just. I kind of forgot to mention the step of univariate regression. So without, I don't have any of the equations here, but we all know. Um, I don't need to listen right now. We all know um, the equation. You know, the dependent variable equals uh, the beta times the independent variable plus the error, right? y equals bx plus e and you know those of us that have kids are going through grade six seven eight they're all learning that linear equation right and so cpca this constraint part of it when you're talking about row constraints is nothing more than so we said y equals bx plus e so also y equals y hat plus e where y hat is the predicted score right? Beta times the x is the predicted score. And so what you're doing for the constraining part to get that 10% of the variance is actually 50,000 y hats, right? So normally when we do a, a like one dependent variable, one independent variable, you know, when we teach our kids how to compute the slope of the line, the predicted score is what you get, what you would predict on y from the information you have on x and that's the predicted score that's a y hat 10 percent of the variability in the bold signal is 50,000 y hat so yeah so like the all the rest of it the other 90 percent is all the error that you couldn't predict the the variance in y that you couldn't predict from x so that's it you could actually do 50,000 univariate regressions and save all of the predicted scores into that matrix and that would be the same thing okay, great. super simple thanks but then you do the pc and the predicted scores which seems to be pretty straightforward to me but it's a step that people never do that's the basic idea of cpca constrain the variance first and then do a pca on the constrained variance and that's the simplest version of it which literally you could do with spss or any univariate package. You can save the predicted scores and then you can do a PCA on them. Fantastic. Thank you. It's, it's simple.
All right, great. So we have a question from uh, Natasha. Hi, Todd. Thanks a lot for the great talk. Um, sure. I have a question about the interpretation of the results. Um, you're saying that the results you obtain are network patterns. Um, are these co-activated networks or do you regress out the co-activation and look at the functional connectivity of these networks to, to state that I they're know. networks? Or how I are know. you, I guess, how are you operationalizing networks in this case? Uh, <laughs> well, first of all, yeah, I'm not really sure how to, how to answer your question exactly because a lot of these words are very confusing when you say functional connectivity. Usually people mean you've taken a region of interest and you've done correlations with the whole brain. So if you want to, you know, go into more detail about how this relates to those techniques, we can talk more about that. But um, the way that, well, I mean, I'm not sure what to use, but basically a component is based on, you have to understand, as, you know, this is a question that depends on how you understand principal component analysis, right? And principal component analysis is based on eigenvalues. So if I'm, if I'm already not making sense, then... Uh, I'm not sure what else to say, but but eigenvalues are summarizing the massive pattern of intercorrelation between all of the variables, which are voxels, right? So that every one of those networks is based on a principal component analysis of the constrained variance of all the y hats, and so the y hats are all intercorrelated with each other in certain ways. So it's like a massive type of functional connectivity where you don't just choose one region and find what's correlated with that region you look at the pattern of all regions correlated together so it's like a you know multivariate functional connectivity analysis so you know functional connectivity is main, saying you have to see see what's um, related to this one region but and it might come up with something like a principal component analysis but you have to choose as your as your um, region of interest, something that's in the network that you end up wanting, which you would never know until you've done the principal component analysis in the first place. Thanks. I think what I'm saying is, are they are can the functional can the covariance that's um, obtained be due to co-activation and not necessarily network communication, which is more a time series? Oh yeah, it's all just correlational. Principal component analysis based on correlations. There's no causation here at all. Okay. Thanks. Okay. All right, thank you. Other questions? Uh, just on, on my side, uh, again, going back to symptoms. So you, you, you've shown some, some work with uh, auditory hallucination. And, and often, I mean, clinically, uh, my experience is uh, that people who experience uh, auditory hallucination often have some kind of a oriented uh, like response that they tend to move their head or their eyes and kind of sense today when this is happening. So I'm just uh, wondering, uh, you mentioned uh, before um, like the uh, movement, but uh, what, have you looked into the association between auditory hallucination and uh, head movement? So yeah, we have uh, through the International Consortium on Hallucination Research, we collected together three data sets from around the world that um, are actually, you know, uh, capturing uh, the, the hallucination capture type of fMRI data. And there's not, there's not consistently in all the data sets a movement artifact, but you know, if there is a movement artifact, it comes out so easily in these data because like I've been showing you, um, those are the, those are the networks, at least some version of those networks are the task-based networks. And they'll be also active you know, for hallucinations or responding or whatever. And so when you see a movement, I don't have a picture of it, but it basically looks like in the, the activity or you know, can be around the edge of the um, ventricles or right around the edge of the brain. It looks like rubbish, you can tell right away. And the other thing is, well, movement can be a little bit misleading because you end up finding, you just, there you'll, you'll see this, so you see, and then if there's a movement um, network, it's not a network, it's just movement, but it'll be kind of all around the edge of the brain. And then usually this response is kind of just like random, you know, but sometimes like a, a student of mine is doing an analysis of pain pain perception 
So when people are actually uh, like there's a there's a um, piece of metal that induces heat on the person's arm, and when they get that, they actually move every single time, and they move more when there's more pain. So it looked exactly like the hemodynamic response, the movement artifact. And if we had looked at only the hemodynamic response shape, we would have thought, oh, here's a network that's involved in pain perception. So if it wasn't for knowing that the movement um, artifact is always kind of peripheral type of thing or ventricle, then we would not, we might have been fooled in that case. But normally when we see a movement parameter, yeah, it's, it's just, you can see anatomically and you can see through the what what is you know masquerading as a hemodynamic response, but I haven't seen that in the uh, in the hallucinations capture data. All right, great, thank you. So, any more uh, or final question for Todd? All right. If if not, so I, I want to thank you again, Todd, for uh, taking the time to make this uh, great talk for us uh, today on on your birthday. So I hope you get to celebrate uh, later today. So thank thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah.